Um, but the main body of consumer feedback will happen um, later in the summer when those products are in the stores, and then we'll go through some proper you know, post post launch feedback. Thanks, Andrew. Francisco Esprit from Eco Securities. Just wondering, in relation to that specific example of the um, shampoo, um, how much of the total footprint were you able to actually measure from real data, like actual reports? And at what point, as I imagine, for some um, materials, for example, you have to simply say, okay, we can't go back to the supplier of the PET plastic or whatever, we're just going to use the um, published um, data. Or that. What was the rough ratio between the sort of uh, measured and proxy estimated? Um, at the front end of the process, we agreed because we did actually go to all suppliers, including PT suppliers, to get the information. Um, if like, the information became more generic and you got to things like waste disposal um, issues at the back end of the, of the process, they were using sort of different figures on proportions of um, waste that goes to landfill as opposed to recycle. Um, because obviously that, that's like the national figure, and obviously we weren't able to measure exactly how many shampoo bottles appeared in the in landfill, how many shampoo bottles were um, recycled. But actually, when we got to the ingredients, the data was quite at the back end, and, and production and distribution, the data was very precise. So the sort of more generic data was actually the um, consumer use and the um, end of life scenarios. How feasible do you think that is to continue doing that for uh, products, or would you use more shortcuts in the future? Um, I think that obviously depends on how the methodology evolves. Um, obviously, accuracy and preciseness is, is the goal. And I think the key to this is actually building up the data sets of um, data for raw materials. So, for example, in the case of PET, if we can work the plastics industry to come up with a guaranteed data set for PET which is going to be used in different applications. That would be the goal. Similarly with the other um, ingredients, the patents, um, active, etc. Make sure that those common data sets are used for every subsequent carbon footprint. I mean, in the case of shampoo, it's not a big step from a, to a carbon footprint of shampoo then to a carbon footprint of conditioner and from our other um, wash products such as shower gels, uh, water washing, etc. We've probably, we've probably got 50% to two thirds of the data to do those other products from what we've done already. So to see as, as the data builds up, then the, the process will become easier. And as long as we've got three standards and three data sets, and everybody's working to those similar data sets, I think that's, that's how the process should evolve. Thanks very much, Andrew. Thank you. to the stage. Uh, our next panel is going to be chaired by Emily Farnworth. Emily is Leadership Group Manager of the Climate Group. And just to mention that we're actually going to hear more on the topic of carbon labeling on Thursday from the NASA. Tesco will also be a part of that day's workshop and they've of course um, committed to label their 70,000 products.
apologies, from um, the DEFRA, from the Department of Environment, Food and Water Affairs. Um, and so, obviously, the, the DEFRA has been involved in many um, projects around supply chain, and uh, particularly as it relates to food production, um, given that there's a lot of complex issues relating to carbon in, in agriculture, and particularly um, the food and, and drink production. So, it's great to have you all here. Um, I'm going to open up with a few questions to the panel, and then um, we're going to save uh, we have 10 minutes at the end of, of this discussion to take some, some questions from you all as well. So maybe just going to take a slight step back um, in, in terms of, sort of thinking about carbon and supply chain. And one of the questions that I think needs to be tackled is, is sort of why? Why are we spending so much time thinking about carbon and supply chain? We're spending a lot of time and effort measuring carbon and supply chain. So that's really a question I'd like to open up on. So maybe I can start with you. Um, why? I think I think we've actually heard a lot of the, the reasons for why already this morning. Um, because I think many of the reasons for, for why you want to pursue carbon reduction across the supply chain are exactly the same reasons as you'd want to pursue carbon reduction in your own business. Um, it's about uh, understanding existing business processes to make them more efficient. It's about reducing your energy costs. Um, we, we have from Excuse me, we heard from Andrew at uh, Boots about the, the cost savings and um, the, the, the carbon savings that he found in the, the shampoo project, a 20% reduction across the, across the manufacturing processes. Um, and that translates directly into to energy cost savings too, which hits the bottom line and, and makes the business more profitable. So really, um, you know, the business case almost falls out there. Um, and, and I think the other reason is, is um, you know, looking away from cost towards towards revenue, and, and that's that consumers are starting to ask for this. Um, you know, we heard about the, the most expensive, most expensive example from from Richard first thing. Um, you know, we've seen that in many of the companies we've worked with, that, that consumers are starting to, to to ask for this information. We ourselves did some research late last year that that showed that. Um, more than 60% of consumers wanted to buy from companies doing the right thing. Um, two thirds of consumers wanted to buy products that have a low carbon footprint. Um, now what consumers say and what consumers do are, are not necessarily the same things, but, but even still there's I think a pretty telling, uh, telling examples, telling percentages. So, so that says to me there's a real opportunity for companies to get on the front foot to do this work across the chain and to communicate um, the results of that through to the market. Taking a sort of, uh, an example from another area, um, a colleague of Richard's at Marks & Spencer said to me that as the brand owner, they're really the ones with a neck on the line. Um, if a consumer goes into Marks & Spencer or, or any other store, buys a shirt, and finds out that the buttons in that shirt have been sewn on by a 10 year old. They don't care who owns the factory in the developing world. They bought it in Marks and Spencer. It's Marks and Spencer that they hold responsible. Um, and I think you can, you, you we're starting to see similar responses for, for, you know, with, with climate change in mind, where it's the brand owner that carries um, at least a portion of the burden for what goes on across the supply chain and really getting their hand. Uh, their head and their hands around that can uh, can really improve their ability to communicate the, the benefits down the chain. I don't think I've really got much to add, except um, you know, that there's, there's quite a lot of evidence for a lot of the benefits, and the one that there really isn't a lot of tangible evidence yet is the one about whether consumers are actually willing to pay and you know, turn what they're saying in surveys into real action. And that's why I think it's great that um, the boots and walkers and others have you know, got products that are going out there and that can actually um, produce some, some real data, which I think would be very useful for all other sectors as well. Great, thanks. Anything else you'd like to Okay, just a couple of points, because uh, most of them have been made. Um, I mean, why supply chains? I think one of the things that has only really recently been realised, even though it's, it's actually quite obvious, is that all your carbon impacts, all environmental impacts across the whole of society are actually driven by 
the consumption and production of, of products and services. And I think, therefore, 